Good morning. Welcome. Today, our text will be found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. Luke, chapter 10. Uh, there's a funny story about St. Peter. He's admitting people at the gates of heaven. And St. Peter asks one man who appears, he says, Tell me one act of kindness that you committed during your lifetime. And the man said, Oh, said, one time I saw a rough-looking gang of motorcycle riders harassing an old lady, and I walked right up and I punched the gang leader right in the nose. And St. Peter said, Wow, when did that happen? And the guy said, Oh, about five minutes ago. You know, sometimes you can get into trouble when you try to help somebody. Today we're going to talk about the Good Samaritan a person who performed an act of kindness and became famous. Now, we don't know his name, but virtually everyone has heard of the Good Samaritan. We name hospitals after him. We have a Good Samaritan Outreach Center and the Good Sam RV Club. We even have Good Samaritan laws protecting citizens from being liable if they stop to render aid to injured strangers. Some states have Good Samaritan laws requiring citizens to lend aid. All this comes from a beautiful little story that Jesus told 2,000 years ago. As we examine this passage today, let's walk through it slowly. You'll notice the entire discussion centers around three questions. The first question is the almost right question. We read in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. Now, many translations call the man who asked this question a lawyer. And in Jesus' day, a lawyer was someone who knew the Old Testament. He was trained in theology, and he was gifted in public debate. The religious leaders probably sent him to Jesus, hoping to trap Jesus into saying something foolish. And so the lawyer asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now that sounds like a pretty good question, doesn't it? But to the lawyer's chagrin, Jesus answers his question with another question. Jesus said, you know the Bible backwards and forwards. What does it say? Um, you know, I read recently that Jesus asked over 300 questions in the four gospel accounts. Now, I haven't counted yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if that were correct. He was, was always listening to people. And he asked, what do you think? You know, every morning, Orthodox Jews recite the Shema, and it spoke of loving God with all of one's being. The lawyer gave the right answer. If you want to go to heaven, you've got to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and all, everything that you have. And while you're at it, you've got to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that was not only the right answer, it was actually the quotation of two Old Testament passages. It was also the Reader's Digest condensed version of the Ten Commandments. And Jesus said, good answer. And then with the twinkle in his eye, Jesus threw him a curveball and says, do this and you will live. Now, the word live that Jesus uses here in the Greek is not bios, which would signify health or biological life. It's the word zoa, which means a full and meaningful life. See, the lawyer's question was almost right. 
but almost only counts in horseshoes and grenades. There's one little word in the lawyer's question that spoils it. Now, was Jesus teaching salvation by works? Absolutely not. He was merely pointing out that if you could truly love God and love others perfectly, you would have eternal life. See, God demands perfection. That means loving God always, every second of every day, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, never deviating from that moment that you are born until your final breath. And that also means loving other people perfectly all the time. That is God's standard. It's perfection or nothing. And Jesus is really telling this fella, you want to go to heaven? Great. Be perfect and you'll make it. Whoops, how do you do that? Well, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And God doesn't grade on the curve. You know, well, this person's sins aren't as bad as that person's sins. See, that's why we need the gospel. Now, that brings us back to the lawyer's one word that messed up his answer. Eternal life the greatest issue of life, but it can't be inherited by what you do. The quest for eternal life is a good one, and every one of us should be on. (laughs) You know, we should be uh, pursuing eternal life. And the lawyer asked the question, (coughs) what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, you and I can't do anything to gain eternal life. Jesus has already done everything that needs to be done. You don't have to do anything to inherit eternal life. Now, you don't have to do anything to inherit something. See, the only way to inherit eternal life is to be born into the family of God. Actually, we get adopted, but there's nothing that you can do. But once you are in the family, you are an heir. And Jesus was issuing a challenge when he said this to the lawyer, do this and live. Now, what made it such such a challenge? Because the lawyer knew he couldn't do it 100% of the time. Now, Some of us, you know, we still think that there's something we can do to gain eternal life. And Jesus says, do this, keep all the commandments, all the time, from the moment you're born to the moment you die, do it and you shall live. So let me just take a little survey. You know, I want... You know, if you're watching this, just raise your hand if you've never broken any of the Ten Commandments. Anybody? Now, if you're looking at your screen with your hand in the air, you know, first of all, you look like a doofus. But secondly, you're probably breaking the one that says you shall not bear false witness. Okay? So all of us have already forfeited that chance. We need some help. Eternal life is not a routine, it's not a ritual, it is a relationship. Now here's the difference between living under the law and living under grace. The law says, do this and live, and it's impossible. Grace says, live and do this. See, that is possible through Jesus Christ. So now the lawyer is beginning to sweat bullets, and I'm sure he's beginning to regret that he said anything. You know, it's like raising your hand to ask a question in class and then having the teacher make you look like an idiot. Jesus has turned this fellow into a pretzel, and it took him less than 20 words to do it. Not bad. That leads us to the second question we see, and question number two is, the wrong question. 
We read in verse 29 of Luke 10, but he, wanting to justify himself, you see, as a lawyer, he was looking for a loophole, looking to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? You know, it says that the lawyer wanted to justify himself. That means Jesus had painted him into a corner, and now he wants out of the corner. He knew that he loved God, but what about this loving my neighbor part? So here's the question, the wrong question. Who is my neighbor? Now, it may sound like a pretty good question to you, but it totally misses the point. See, the lawyer read that command as love your neighbor as yourself. He read it this way, love your Jewish neighbor as yourself. See, his definition of neighbor excluded the Samaritans and the Gentiles. I mean, he would be a neighbor to the Jews and no one else. He wants a definition so that he'll know who he has to help and who it is that he can ignore. He wants Jesus to draw a circle. He'll gladly love everyone within the circle, but he doesn't want to be bothered with anyone outside the circle. And so Jesus draws him a circle, and it's a lot bigger than he he bargained for. You know, I mean, when you say, tell me who I have to love, what you're really saying is, tell me who I don't have to love. This lawyer was looking for a loophole, a legal limit on who he had to love. Jesus is about to explode his loophole and blow his mind at the same time. So Jesus doesn't directly answer the question, and he doesn't quote the Greek to try to explain how the word neighbor is used in the Old Testament. He doesn't offer some dissertation on his derivation from ancient languages. And and the Jewish lawyer and the crowd, they would have had no trouble with Jesus' answer if he'd have simply said, your neighbor is the one who lives the close to you, that person who is a lot like you. You know, if Jesus had said, your neighbors are your Jewish people, everyone would have been satisfied. But instead of a theological treatise or a seminar on cultural anthropology, Jesus tells a simple, elegant story. And since most of you have already heard this story before, let's walk through it slowly and study what Jesus was saying. Uh, Some literary experts call this the greatest short story ever written. It includes a tragedy. It includes villains. It includes a plot twist, a hero, and a good ending. We read in verse 30 of Luke chapter 10, Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, Jesus doesn't say whether this man is a Jew or a Gentile, because in the end, it shouldn't really matter. Geography helps us understand this story. Jesus said that the man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem is in the mountains, and Jericho is in the arid plains by the Jordan River, not far from the Dead Sea. The Romans had built a narrow winding road that snaked its way through those mountains. The road was in those days very desolate. In the 17 miles from Jerusalem to Jericho, the road descends about 3,000 feet in elevation. Locals called it the bloody way because of the robbers who found ample hiding places from which they could attack the unsuspecting travelers. It was a thieves' paradise, and this certain man, traveling alone, fell victim to their evil designs. The scripture says (coughs) that they stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Evidently, they waited for this poor guy until he came into view, and then they jumped him, and they beat him, and stripped him, and robbed him, and left him for dead. 
Unfortunately, the robbers forgot to hang a sign around his neck that read, Neighbor. Or maybe they stole that too, I don't know. But the fact that they removed his clothes created a problem. See, a person's cultural identity was revealed by how they dressed. You know, even today, Arabs and Jews dress differently. The fact that this man was naked prevented passersby from figuring out if he was a Jew or a Gentile. Verse 31 says, Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Uh, Surely these religious professionals, the good guys, would help this hurting man. After all, it was their job. Here's the irony in the whole story. Both men are truly and deeply religious. I mean, if you ask them, do you love God? They would answer, of course we do. And they would have been it. And on one level, at least, it would have been true. They were men who spent their days worshiping God and leading others to worship God. And so it is against that background that their failure seems so great. They both have come from the presence of God, but somehow God's presence never got through to them. Jewish storytelling often followed a pattern of threes, and so after two failures, the audience would have been expecting the next character to do better. Surely, they suspected the third traveler would just simply be a simple Jewish man who would have helped the wounded stranger. But Jesus had another big surprise in store. We read in verse 33, but a certain Samaritan. Whoa, (laughs) the jaws of the whole audience must have dropped at that. The kind of animosity existing between Israelis and Palestinians today closely follows how poorly Jews and Samaritans got along in Jesus' time. The Jews thought the Samaritans were racial and religious half-breed heretics, and the Samaritans thought the Jews were arrogant know-it-alls. To say that the two groups didn't like one another would be putting it mildly. And if the poor man by the side of the road had been a Samaritan, the priest and the Levite would have said, well, he got what he deserved. By the way, Jesus doesn't call him a good Samaritan. You know, that's a label that we have added on. To the Jews, the phrase good Samaritan would have been an oxymoron, two words that canceled each other out, like jumbo shrimp or reds baseball the samaritan should have been the villain but jesus makes him the hero we read in verse 33 but a certain samaritan as he journeyed came where he was and when he saw him he had compassion the word compassion literally means he got a sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach because he was so concerned. Verse 34 says, So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Now, travelers didn't usually carry bandages with them. The wounded man was naked, so obviously this traveler took some of his own clothes and ripped them into strips to be tied around the wounds of the stranger. His oil and his wine came from the meager food supply that he would travel with. He used these to cleanse the wounds and to revive the stranger. Obviously, the fellow was so injured that he couldn't walk. And verse 34 continues, And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Verse 35, On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. Now, 
This was not the way that Jesus' audience expected the story to end. The Samaritan's behavior would have stunned the the listeners. (laughs) Into the moments of silence at the end of the story, Jesus inserts his own question. And question number three would be the right question. Verse 36. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. There is the clear directive. Our behavior towards people should follow the model behavior of this Samaritan. So the right question is, to whom may I be a neighbor? See, in the beginning, the lawyer had asked, who is my neighbor? He wanted a definition and a limitation. But Jesus changes the question all around. Not who is my neighbor, but whose neighbor am I? You know, there's a world of difference here. To ask who is my neighbor is to focus on what claim others have on my time and energy and resources. But to ask whose neighbor am I is to focus on what I owe to the suffering people all around me. See, our neighbor is anyone to whom we can show love and kindness. Notice how the lawyer answers Jesus. The one true neighbor was the one who had mercy on him. See, he is so prejudiced that he won't even use the name Samaritan. It's a dirty word to him. And Jesus' application is simple and to the point. Go and do likewise. You know, all of God's commands can be summarized in these two principles. Love God and love your neighbor. Are you doing that? <laughs> 1 John 4.20 says, If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Now let's leave the story and learn very four practical lessons from the Samaritan. Here's the first lesson. Demonstrate kindness to strangers. You know, someone said kindness is love with its work clothes on. The true test of love is not whether we can love those whom we know and those who love us. But this parable is all about showing love and kindness to total strangers. Jesus put this put it this way in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 46. Jesus said, if all you do is love those who love you, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. That's out of the message paraphrase. Do you know why we love some people. We love them so they'll love us back. I mean, we want people to love us. From the time you wrote that very first love note in second grade that says, Dear Mary or Dear Bobby, I love you. Do you love me? Check yes or no. And sometimes we'd even insert P.S. Even if you don't love me, I'll still love you. But we really don't mean that last part, you know. I mean, if Bobby or Mary happened to check no, well, that was the end of that romance. But we still do it when we get older. But loving someone so they'll love us in return is actually pretty selfish. Jesus said that even sinners do that. You know, Jesus taught a kind of love that should be directed towards those who won't pay us back, to strangers, and even to our enemies. So let me ask you, who are your neighbors? 
Did you think about the people who live near you? They're included. That's a good place to start, but a bad place to end. You know, our English word neighbor comes from two old Anglo-Saxon words, ne being, meaning near and geber meaning dweller. So the word actually means those who dwell near us. But in this parable, Jesus expanded the application to mean our neighbor is anyone who would benefit from our kindness. Jesus told us to love our neighbors, and that includes total strangers. You haven't really loved your neighbor until you've demonstrated love to someone who is a stranger and, as far as you know, doesn't have the capacity to pay you back. You know, in our own congregation, as I'm sure it is in your congregation, we're usually kind and generous to each other. I mean, the folks in this church are amazing. They show an amazing level of love and compassion towards one another. But are we showing the same kind of kindness to total strangers, even if they're dirty? The wounded man was messy and bloody. The Samaritan got dirty and bloody when he bandaged him and cleaned his wounds. Will we show the love of Jesus to total strangers, even if they're dirty and wounded? The second lesson that we see out of this story is to see the value of small acts of kindness. You know, the Samaritan didn't have much with him, but he used what he had. He used his clothes for bandages. He poured oil and wine on the wounds. He used what he had to help the poor wounded stranger. You know, there's tremendous value in performing small acts of kindness. Jesus said, why anyone by just giving a cup of cold water in my name is on our side. Count on it that God will notice. Jesus says that God notices stuff like that. (laughs) Not all of us can be like a Mother Teresa and give our entire lives to helping hurting people. But Mother Teresa once said, none of us can do anything great on our own, but we can all do a small thing with great love. A third lesson we gain out of this story is practice love that goes beyond normal kindness. You know, there's a level of human decency and kindness that many people display. You don't even have to be a Christian to be kind. There are many people who are into what is often called random acts of kindness. You know, some people actually confuse kindness with salvation. Uh, I've heard people say that some lady must surely be in heaven because she showed kindness to animals and to strangers. Well, being kind won't get you into heaven. Only knowing Jesus will get you into heaven. And as Christians, we don't love our neighbor to earn salvation. We love our neighbors because we have salvation. Jesus directed kindness always goes beyond the human level of expectation. What would human decency have expected from the Samaritan? You know, maybe he could have stayed there by the road until the man could walk on his own and then head on his own way. But he did more. Maybe he could have taken him to the inn and left him. But he did more. Maybe he could have told the innkeeper that the wounded man would be responsible for his own expenses, but he did more. Maybe he could have said, well, don't let his expenses exceed these two silver coins, but he did more. See, that's real loving kindness. Jesus said, if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. It was expected of the Jews under Roman occupation to carry a soldier's supplies for one mile only. And Jesus said that love always goes the second mile. That brings us to the fourth lesson we see. 
give God the credit for your kindness. Now, this is extremely important. What's the difference between a non-believer's random act of kindness and our performance of an intentional act of kindness? See, as followers of Christ, the goal of our kindness must be that God receives the honor and glory for our good deed. Jesus says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You know, don't say, well, I'll do more when I know more. No, you know too much already. Act on what you know, and God will bless you. Don't say, well, if I'm ever going down a lonely road and I happen to see a dying man, I'll stop and help him. No, that fellow's already all around us. He's young, old, male, female, rich, poor, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, a child, a beggar, a divorcee, a cancer victim, an AIDS patient, an out-of-work engineer, a single parent, a lonely widow, a new arrival from another country. He doesn't look or act like you. He doesn't sound like you, but he's there anyway, and God has put him in our paths. You can't avoid them. What will you do? Will you just walk on by? Start with the need that is near you, and God will give you grace. Our religion is empty if it doesn't compel us to reach out to those who are hurting, whose paths we cross. All around us, men and women and folks are dying. We have plenty of priests, and we got a truckload of Levites. But where are the Good Samaritans? You know, this week all of us will walk the Jericho Road. And sooner or later, we're bound to meet someone in need. Don't ask, who is that man and how did he get here? Don't ask, is this a friend or foe? (laughs) Don't ask, do I know this person? Don't ask, what did he do to deserve this? Don't ask, is he of my, my religion? Is he of my color? Is he of my family, my tribe, my background, my language, my people? If he is in need and you can help him, he is your neighbor. Will you be his neighbor? You know, finally in this story, we see the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ever since Eden, the human race has been on a journey away from Jerusalem. We've been going down, down, down into the Jericho Valley. One day we were brutally attacked by Satan and left for dead. He robbed us of our dignity and stripped us of our righteousness. Along came the good Samaritan himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. He bound our wounds. He carried us to safety. He paid our debt. And he guaranteed our future. He has shown mercy to us when we were left for dead by the side of the road. Jesus is the Good Samaritan. Here's the message for those who are still lying by the road, wounded and bleeding, forgotten and abandoned. This is for those who feel hopeless and helpless. This is for those who have been destroyed by sin. Jesus comes to help you. Will you not give him your heart? Will you not love him and trust him and serve him? Will you not believe in him? The good Samaritan comes to save you. Will you not come to him and trust him as Lord and Savior? I close with this word to those that he has rescued. Look to your master and recall what he did for you. Gaze upon the one who left heaven for you. Remember that when everyone else passed by, Jesus stopped to save you. Then in his name and in his power and with his strength and for his glory, go 
and do likewise. And the Lord will be with you. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. Lord, I know that we have heard this story many times, and for some of us, maybe we've heard this dozens of times throughout the years. Father, at the danger of passing it off as just, you know, over-familiarity, Lord, help us to once again realize that we were in need of a Savior. We were left beside the road, and it was only through the Good Samaritan coming to us that we were saved. Father, help us to reach out to those around us. Help us to be a neighbor to those that you put in our, our paths. Father, we pray that we would be bold. We pray that we would be obedient. Thank you, Lord. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining in today. Next week, we'll continue our series, Conversations with Jesus, and we hope that you can be with us. Also, Lord willing, we'll be live this Wednesday morning at 10.30 a.m., for our online Bible study from the Gospel of Luke. That's 10.30 a.m. live on Facebook. Thanks again for joining in. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.